As a photographer, you know that light is essential. Without it, photography is impossible. A lot of times we don't consider light more than, is there enough of it? What direction is it coming from? What color is it? And how large is it? These are important things to be sure, but the understanding of light doesn't end there. And once you have a better understanding of light and how it interacts with matter, you can make better use of it. You can predict what it's going to do and you can get results that you never thought were possible. Hi, my name is David Bode for Tuts Plus, and in this course, you're going to learn about what light is and how it interacts with matter. Now, I know that sounds kind of simple, but consider that we only see light that either comes directly from a light source or that has been reflected from or transmitted through objects. So understanding how light interacts with matter covers pretty much everything. To start, you're going to learn about visible light and how that fits into the larger electromagnetic spectrum. Next, you will learn about the three most important qualities of light to photographers, brightness, color, and contrast. Then you will learn about how light interacts with matter. You will learn how light is absorbed, how light is transmitted, and how light is reflected. Finally, you will learn about and see some great examples of the three types of reflection, diffuse, direct, and polarized. At the end of this course, you will have learned a ton about light. This will help you to be able to control light, to predict what it's going to do, and help you to translate your ideas into fantastic looking images. To start, check out the next lesson, where you will learn some of the basics of light and how visible light fits into the much larger electromagnetic spectrum. Visible light is only a portion of the electromagnetic radiation spectrum and is a rather complex subject. Despite this complexity, there are some fundamentals that you should know, and in this lesson, you will learn some of the basics of light. When we use the word light, most of the time we are referring to visible light, that is, light that is visible to the human eye, the kind of light that makes our sense of vision possible. Visible light is only a small part of a larger spectrum of electromagnetic radiation, which includes radio, microwave, infrared, the visible region that we perceive as light, ultraviolet, X-rays, and gamma rays. Electromagnetic radiation, including the visible spectrum, behaves like a wave and like a particle. Light waves that encounter an obstacle can interfere with each other, which is called diffraction. In photography, you may be familiar with this concept. If you close down your aperture too far, the light starts to create an interference pattern on your image sensor, and your image will start to look softer. This is diffraction at work. Light also acts as a particle. In the late 19th and early 20th century, experiments with light and metals showed that light could cause electrons to be emitted or ejected from metals. This meant that light acted like a particle, and these particles were called photons. Now this idea of light behaving like a wave and light behaving like a particle is all very, very complex stuff. How complex? Well, the particle nature of light was first explained by Albert Einstein, the greatest scientific mind in history. However, I think it's important to understand, at least at a very simple level, how light acts as a particle and a wave, because it will help explain how light interacts with matter. Sometimes it's easier to think about light interacting with matter as a particle, and sometimes it's easier to think about light interacting with matter as a wave. This isn't some kind of scientific shortcut, it's more about using the explanation that makes the most sense to those of us who haven't spent our lives studying physics. When a wave passes through an opening or a slit, the wave radiates outward with a spherical pattern. This apparent change in direction is called diffraction. If you do this with light, it creates a band of light on the wall behind the opening that's larger than the slit. With two slits, you would expect two bands of light on the other side. 
what happens is something much different. The light coming through the slit appears to interfere with itself, creating an interference pattern on the wall. This is called the double slit experiment. And in the early 1800s, this experiment helped to solidify the acceptance of the wave theory of light. In my experiment, I'm going to shine a green laser at two very narrow slits created by these three pieces of graphite taped so close together they're almost touching. As you can see, when I push the graphite in front of the laser, that same interference pattern is created. This is not some kind of trick, and to show you that, I'm going to add some smoke to the equation so that you can see that the bands of light are coming from the graphite and the single laser beam. In this experiment, I'm going to show you the photoelectric effect. I have an aluminum can connected to a steel wire that's connected to strips of aluminum foil. In order to show you how this works, I need to charge up the metal with electrons. To do this, I'm going to rub a plastic bag on a piece of PVC pipe. This will cause the pipe to steal some electrons from the bag. Then if I touch the pipe to the aluminum strips, the electrons will be transferred to the aluminum and they will repel each other. They do this because my can and strip apparatus now has a net negative charge and like charges repel each other. Next I'm going to shine a UV light on the can. The light is now off, and you can see that holding it close to the can doesn't change the charge on the metal. Once I turn the light on and bring it close to the can, watch the foil strips. They start to relax. The UV light is causing the electrons to be ejected from the can. This neutralizes the charge, and the aluminum strips start to relax. Now what would happen if I tried this with a very bright green laser? Nothing because green light doesn't have the same energy as UV light, no matter how bright it is. What about a super bright spotlight? That's not going to work either, because the amount of energy in light is related to its frequency, not the quantity. Because UV light has a higher energy compared to visible light, it will cause the electrons to be ejected from the can in this experiment. But lower energy, and thus lower frequency light, won't have any effect at all. So as Einstein explained, electromagnetic radiation is made up of photons. Photons are tiny bits of energy that travel through a vacuum at the speed of light. Photons have no mass and carry a certain quantifiable level of energy, which is also related to the frequency of the electromagnetic wave. The electromagnetic field around the photon fluctuates from positive, to negative and back to positive as the photons move through space. According to the wiki, this can be thought of as a self-propagating transverse oscillating wave. And if you didn't study physics, which I didn't, this is probably a bit confusing. Let me try and unpack that for you. Self-propagating refers to the fact that a changing electric field generates a changing magnetic field, and a changing magnetic field generates a changing electric field. The result is that it creates an infinite loop that self-propagates through space. A transverse wave is a moving wave that consists of oscillations occurring perpendicular to the direction of the wave. So if a wave is moving along the x-axis, oscillations have to be in the y-axis or the z-axis. As you may have guessed, electromagnetic waves have two components. There is an electric field and a magnetic field that are oriented 90 degrees from each other, and they are always in phase. In this example, the electric field is in the y-axis, and the magnetic field is in the z-axis. The wave is traveling in the x-axis. As we look at more examples of how these waves work, it will get really confusing to look at both fields at the same time. And it's often good enough to just talk about the direction and orientation of the electric field. This wave has a lot of similarities to other waves that you might be familiar with, like water waves. The wave has crests and troughs, and the distance between the crests is called a wavelength. Frequency is the number of complete wave cycles, or wavelengths, that pass a point in space in one second. Like many things in science, this measurement has a name called Hertz. This was named after Heinrich Rudolf Hertz, a German physicist who first conclusively proved the existence of electromagnetic waves.
These waves were theorized by James Clark Maxwell's electromagnetic theory of light. Unlike water waves, the faster an electromagnetic wave oscillates, or the higher the frequency, the more energy the wave has. In the visible spectrum, we see these differences in frequency as color. Red has the longest wavelength, and therefore the lowest energy of visible light. Violet is the highest frequency, and has the highest energy of visible light. Check out what is just above violet. Ultraviolet light. Ultraviolet light has even more energy than visible light, and this is where electromagnetic waves start to become harmful to humans. As you move up the scale, you get into X-rays and gamma rays, which, as you probably know, are even more harmful. As you move down the scale, just past visible light, you get into infrared, then microwaves, and finally, long radio waves. Infrared is often associated with heat. This is because infrared energy causes molecules to vibrate faster, and we feel this as heat. In fact, everything in the universe is emitting infrared light. You are emitting infrared energy right now, but you can't see it because infrared is outside the visible spectrum of light. Unlike other forms of energy, electromagnetic radiation does not need a medium to travel through. Electromagnetic radiation can travel through a vacuum. In photography, we are primarily concerned with the visible part of the spectrum, which, from this point forward, I'm going to just refer to as light. In the next few lessons, you will learn about the essential properties of light that are of most concern to photographers, and it starts with brightness. In this lesson, you will learn why brightness is the most important quality of a light source. If a light isn't bright enough, photography isn't possible, at least what I would consider to be quote-unquote normal photography. The latest generation of super sensitive cameras can take photos in incredibly low light. This doesn't mean that you don't need to be concerned with lighting, because low light restricts the creative possibilities. For example, if you are shooting in super low light, you're going to be using big wide apertures, long exposure times, and high ISOs just to get an exposure. A single lighting source can drastically change your options in a case like this, and usually, the brighter the light, the more options you have. This is because you can do more with a bright light. You can spread the light over a larger area, or you can shoot subjects at a greater distance. So brighter, at the most basic level, is almost always better. But what is brightness? You have observed varying levels of brightness throughout your life. You could easily say that the sun is definitely brighter than any constant lighting source you have ever had in your house. But could you tell the difference between the sun's brightness on two separate days? Now it gets a little bit harder. You know it's bright, but how bright? Our perception of brightness is subjective, and your eyes and brain can deceive you. Thinking about what you have learned in the previous lesson, you know that light and all other forms of electromagnetic radiation is made up of photons. Photons, at a certain wavelength, have a fixed level of energy. If you have a certain level of brightness in a given area, and you want to increase the brightness, you need to get more photons in that part of the spectrum to hit that area. More photons equals more light. To measure this increase in brightness, it makes sense that we need a device to measure the amount of photons in the visible spectrum. And this is how light meters work. A modern light meter uses a semiconductor like silicon or cadmium sulfide to measure light. When photons strike a silicon photodiode, it creates a very small current. The more photons that strike the photodiode, the more current you will get. When photons strike a photoresistor made with cadmium sulfide, the electrical resistance of the circuit decreases. The more light, the lower the resistance. With a power supply and electronics, these changes can be translated into useful information to help you set exposure. Cameras have built-in light meters that measure the light, and can give you some indication about brightness. They do this by measuring the reflected light often in many areas. It then uses this information to either set some or all of the exposure settings for you. 
or it tells you that the settings that you have selected are going to produce an image that's too bright or too dark. Now, this meter reading on your camera is all relative to the metering mode that your camera is currently set in and your camera's exposure settings. What in-camera light meters don't do is give you an indication of the actual level of brightness in any one area. They also do not work with manual flash lighting. In order to use manual flash lighting and get readings at different points in your scene, you need a handheld light meter. The simplest handheld light meters let you measure light at different parts of your scene, and this can be very helpful in determining what the light is actually doing. This is usually done by measuring the incident light. Unlike reflected light, an incident light meter measures the light that is falling on to the light sensor. This will often give you a much more accurate result because the reflectance of your subject doesn't factor into the measurement. Sometimes taking a photo of a highly reflective object will cause a reflective meter to give a reading that is way off and the exposure would be far too dark. A handheld light meter can usually measure reflected light in addition to incident light, but most of the time you would use incident light metering because it's much more accurate. The other advantage of a handheld light meter is that you can measure different parts of your scene and you can measure the intensity of separate lighting sources. This is very useful for replicating lighting looks and making sure the illumination is even across backgrounds. Light meters measure the light and display the measurement in different units. Advanced meters will display the measurement in lux, foot candle, foot lambert, and candela per square meter. Lux, foot candle, foot lambert, and candela per square meter are all standards for measuring light. For example, foot candle is the amount of illumination the inside surface of a one foot radius sphere would be receiving if there were a uniform point source of one candela in the exact center of the sphere. In contrast to advanced meters, basic light meters will usually have an aperture value mode and an EV display mode. These modes calculate the light reading and then display useful information. In aperture mode, you input the exposure time and the ISO and then take a reading of the light with the meter pointed at the lens of the camera. The meter then displays an F number. If you are setting the exposure for your main light, you would take this reading and set your camera to that F number. Or if there were a particular aperture you wanted to use, say F4, you would take the reading of the light and then make an adjustment to the light so that your meter was reading F4. In EV mode, the meter gives you a reading in EV. EV stands for exposure value and represents a level of light intensity for a camera set to a certain ISO. It has the same logarithmic exposure scale as everything else in photography. For example, EV4 is twice as bright as EV2, or in photo terms, one stop brighter. This number can then be used with a graph to figure out exposure. Let's say I get a reading of EV11 at ISO 100. If I wanted to use a 1 250th of a second exposure time, I need to use an aperture of f2.8. At this point, I can then work out any combination of exposures that will work. You can also work out a conversion from EV to other luminance units. EV11 at ISO 100 is 476 foot candles, 5120 lux, 74.7 .7 foot Lamberts, and 256 candela per square meter. Like I mentioned before, there are meters that will give you readings in lux, foot candle, foot Lambert, and candela per square meter, but more basic meters don't have these options. Another property of light that is useful to understand is what happens to light at distances. To figure that out, we use something called the inverse square law. According to the wiki, in physics, an inverse square law is any physical law stating that a specified physical quantity or intensity is inversely proportional to the square of the distance from the source of that physical quantity. Imagine a light bulb that is radiating in all directions. The total amount of energy coming off the light is constant. If I place a card in the field of this light, the card is illuminated with a portion of this light. If I move the card back, 
twice as far, what happens? The card gets darker, but why? The reason for this is because the light that was filling the card before is now spread out over an area four times as large. This means that at twice the distance, the card now has one quarter of the light falling on it. It works exactly the same with the math. At double the distance of the first measurement, the new intensity is one quarter. If I double it again, I will get one sixteenth, and so on and so on. What you see is that light falls off very quickly from the source, and then sort of tapers off at a much slower rate. And we can use this to our advantage in a number of ways. So I wanted to show you a quick example of the inverse square law in action here. I set up a little demo with my son Lincoln here, and I wanted to show you the dramatic effect the inverse square law can have on your subject and background elements. So to start this little example off, I have my light here positioned very, very close to my son Lincoln. He's about six feet away from the background. And then I took three more shots, and each time I moved the light further back. So this is what the first shot looks like. The metering on all of these is exactly the same. It all reads about F8. So in this first photo here, you can see that the background falls nice and dark. If you look at the second photo here where I pulled the light back, just a few feet, you can see that the background comes up a pretty good amount. You can see the exposure is pretty much the same on Lincoln's face. Now, the lighting looks different because the light is in a different position, and so the shadows are falling in a different place. But if you look at the parts of his face that are actually lit, they're very, very similar in exposure to the previous photo. And you can see in this third photo here, the light is now about seven feet away, it's behind the camera, and the exposure on the background has come up again. If we look at the fourth photo, we have even more of the background coming up, and there's a pretty big difference. By the time we got to the last photo here, the light is about 10 feet in front of Lincoln, which is about 16 feet away from the background. So it's a pretty big difference in distance, but with that inverse square law, it gives you a lot of options in the way things look. Coming up in the next lesson, you're gonna learn all about color. If you've been shooting on a camera for any length of time, you'll be very familiar with the idea that your camera has the ability to change something called white balance. Does this mean that white light is not white? Yes, it does. And in this lesson, you will find out why. Let me ask you another question. Do cameras see the same way you and I see? Yes, in a lot of ways they do. A camera system and your eye both have lenses to focus the light. They both have a device to regulate how much light is entering the system. On a camera, this is the aperture, and on your eye, this is the iris. They both have a system for gathering and interpreting information about the light that is entering the system. Your camera has a sensor, and your eye has the optical nerve. And in terms of color, they both work in a similar way. Our eyes have cones, that are most sensitive to three types of colors, red, green, and blue. And even though we have more red cones in our eyes, we are most sensitive to green light. Similarly, in almost all cameras, there is a color filter that sits over the photo sensor that only passes one color to each pixel. The camera's computer knows what pixels are behind the colors, so it takes the data and produces a color image. Your brain works in a very similar way. That said, our brains are much better at putting the world around us in context in terms of color. Most of the time, these differences show up when you are dealing with white light. Look at a white piece of paper under halogen lights. It looks white. Look at the same piece of paper under fluorescent lighting, and it still looks white. Take the paper outside, and it will still look white, in direct sun, shade, and under cloud cover. The quote-unquote white light is different in all these examples, but your brain is very good at sorting it out and interpreting the colors properly. As you have probably learned in primary school, white light is made up of all the colors in the visible spectrum. You can take white light and shoot it through a prism, and you will break the light apart into its pure colors. You can also take red, blue, and green light, combine them together, and your eyes and probably most cameras will see white light. Now, as I said, white light has more to it than red, blue, and green. It has all of the frequencies of visible light. 
The color temperature of white light depends on the balance of these colors. Modern cameras are quite good at determining white balance automatically, but if it's set wrong, or your camera guesses wrong, white objects do not look white. If your camera has the ability to shoot in RAW, you probably should whenever you can. I usually shoot RAW plus JPEG so that I can quickly preview my files with the JPEGs but still have access to the RAW files. With RAW, you have a direct dump off your camera's image sensor, and you have a lot more room to push things around in post-production without nasty artifacts showing up in the image. In a JPEG, the adjustments have been baked in, and then the compression chucked a bunch of that data out to make the files nice and small. When you make your adjustments in post-production to your JPEG photo, you will have less room to push and pull the values around before those nasty artifacts start showing up. This might not be a huge deal, but then consider that you now need to resave the image. This is going to apply another layer of compression, throwing out even more detail and data. JPEG isn't terrible, but RAW gives you far more options in post-production. And when it comes to color, RAW is the better bet. So what happens when you have a situation where you have mixed lighting? That is, lighting from two or more sources that have different color temperatures. Now things get really interesting. Let's look at some options. So in this example, I wanted to show you a few things you can think about and a few different ideas you can use to try and tackle situations where you have multiple lights with different color temperatures. So in this little illustration here, I've set up a little render and I have some overhead lighting, which is a little bit warmer in color temperature, probably closer to 4,000 to maybe 3,500 Kelvin. And then I have some windows over here to the left, which are closer to daylight probably around five to 6,000 Kelvin. The camera, or the virtual camera in this case, is set to daylight white balance. So the light coming in from the windows looks pretty neutral and it looks pretty white when it shines on a white object. However, the overhead lighting looks pretty yellow. So if you had to take a photo in this kind of environment, you have some color issues that you have to deal with here. So one way you can try and deal with this is to try and isolate the light sources. So maybe you can turn off all of the interior lights and work with the color of the light coming in through the window, whatever that may be. And so this would be your starting point for that. You can see by killing the overhead interior lights, now we just have the daylight color to deal with. Another thing you could try is closing down blinds or blocking the window light and dealing with only the light that's coming from the interior, any interior light fixtures. Now, one problem that you may run into is differences in the interior lighting color temperatures. In this little example here, I have rows that are alternating between kind of warmer white or closer to four to 3,500 Kelvin, and then rows that are a cooler white, maybe closer to five to 6,000 Kelvin. And this is oftentimes what you'll find in an office type situation where they have overhead fluorescent lighting. Sometimes you'll have mismatched bulbs in the same light fixture. Sometimes you'll have patches of daylight color or warmer white, maybe around 4,000 Kelvin. Now, if we go back to just dealing with the window light and killing all the interior lights, one way you can make that look good is to add an additional light, some artificial lighting. Usually that will come in the form of a strobe or a flash. And without any modification, usually strobes and flashes are around 6,500 Kelvin. They may be different between different models, but they're usually a pretty close match to uh, daylight. You may have to gel it a little bit to match. So in this situation, I have the interior lights off. I have the window lights open. You can see on the ceiling here, we definitely are getting some light that's coming in from the windows. And then behind the camera, I've positioned a virtual softbox to fill in the front of my little group shot of Lego guys here. Now maybe you couldn't kill the interior lights and you couldn't kill the window lights. Another way that you can try and deal with this is to add some front fill flash that's somewhere in between these two lighting sources and that's what I've done here. I've used a color that's not quite as orange as the overhead lights and it's not quite as blue as the window light. So it's just a little bit orange, but it falls somewhere in between these overhead lights and the window lights. And with a little bit of color balancing, which you can do in camera, or perhaps you can do that in post-production, you can get this to look pretty good. Now, the overhead lights and the window lights are never gonna look 
perfect unless you spend a lot of time in Photoshop. Either one of them is going to look too orange or the other one is going to look too blue. If we balance this exactly for the overhead lights, it's going to make the window light look really blue. If we balance this for the window light, it's going to make the overhead light look really orange. But you can get it pretty close on your subject, and oftentimes that's the most important thing. So the few ideas that you want to think about here is try and isolate light sources if you can kill one of the light sources that's causing a color discrepancy. That's going to help your colors to be evenly matched. Another idea is you can try and recompose the shot so that your subjects are a good distance away from both of the differing color temperature lights. This will allow the light to basically mix and create kind of an average color temperature between the two sources so that they're kind of evening out on your subjects. That's another great idea. Now, sometimes you may be able to swap light bulbs if you're in a situation where there's not very many lights, and that may help to fix the situation. Now, in this particular case, if this was an office building with this many lights, it may not be very practical, but you can get pretty wide rolls of gel filter. And I've seen that used on the exterior of buildings to gel exterior light and get it to match interior lights. And that can be very effective as well. You can also try and gel interior lights, but if you're dealing with a lot of lights, like we are in our little virtual setup here, that may not be practical. And then the other great option is to use some artificial lighting, like strobes, which can be extremely bright, and you can try and overpower either one of the light sources or try and get it to mix with either of the lighting sources to even out your exposure and even out the color. You may not be able to control all of the background elements in terms of what color temperature light is hitting them when you're using strobes, but as long as you can dial in the color on your subject, that's going to be the most important thing, and that's going to be the thing you want to focus on. So those are a few ideas that you can use when you have to deal with situations where you have multiple lights with different color temperatures. You can also use color for an artistic effect, but that's a subject for another day. Brightness and color are critical to understanding light, but they are not the only characteristics that you need to understand. In the next lesson, you will learn about the contrast of light. At this point in your life, you will have realized that the world looks a lot different on a clear, sunny day compared to an overcast day. Why is this? The answer is contrast, and in this lesson, you'll find out how it works. For the sake of thoroughness, let's talk about what contrast is first. Contrast can be defined as the difference between the light and the dark parts of an image. According to the wiki, contrast is the difference in luminance or color that makes an object or its representation in an image or display distinguishable. Here's an example. In this image, you see a checkerboard pattern with black and white squares. About half this image is as black as your display will allow, and the other half is as white as your display will allow. I say that because if you were to view this on a different display, you might see more or less contrast depending on the quality of the display. If I want to reduce the contrast, I am going to reduce the difference between black and white. What's between black and white? Well, as you probably guessed, it's a medium tone of gray. So, if I make the black squares lighter, a more gray tone, the contrast is reduced. A similar thing happens if I take the white squares and darken them from a bright white to a gray tone. The result is lower contrast. If I take the black squares and the white squares and push them both towards gray, eventually you can't tell that there are any squares at all. So right away, you can see that contrast is important. Without it, you can't define an image. Thankfully, in the real world, everything you shoot will have a little contrast at the very least. So how does contrast relate to light? Let's look at the two ends of the spectrum, high contrast and low contrast. The way to tell the difference is to look at the shadows. A high contrast light will result in a shadow that has a sharp and well-defined edge, like the shadow in this image. This is what you typically get with the sun on a clear day and no clouds in the sky. These types of shadows with well-defined edges are usually called hard shadows, and the lights that produce these shadows are called hard lights. Now, let's imagine that the clouds roll in and obscure the sun. The shadowing on the object will be much different. 
In this situation, the sun's light is scattering through the clouds and it hits the object from many different angles. This is a low contrast light. The result is a shadow with a smoother gradation between the area that's fully in the light and the area that's fully in the dark. This is called a soft shadow, and the lights that produce these types of shadows are called soft lights. The main difference between a high contrast light and a low contrast light is its size relative to the subject. A high contrast light is small relative to the subject, and a low contrast light is large relative to the subject. You know that the sun is enormous, but because it's so far away, it acts as a small lighting source. The clouds on an overcast day are much larger relative to the objects on Earth, so they act as a large lighting source. The illustration of the sun and the clouds is very useful because the same idea applies to modifying photographic lights. Take a small light and shoot it through a much larger material and you get a very similar result. The light from the flash hits the material and is scattered around. This material now becomes the light source, and because it's larger, the light will hit the subject from many different angles. Therefore, you can take a high contrast light and modify it to get a low contrast light. To make a low contrast light into a high contrast light, just think of the sun. Again, you know that the sun is huge, but it's far, far away. Take a low contrast light source, like a softbox, and move it far, far away, and it becomes a high contrast light. In the real world, the contrast of a light source is only one of the factors that determines an image's contrast. I know, this might sound a little bit confusing, but stay with me here. Try thinking about it this way. If you take a bare flash and you use that as your only lighting source, you will get high contrast shadows. But does that mean that your image will be high contrast? Not necessarily. The reason is, I never said anything about how much of the shadows you will actually see. If the flash is very close to the camera's lens, the shadows will be behind the objects that you are shooting. This means that you don't see very much of that shadowing. If the image was made up of objects that were all around the same tonal range, this would not make a very high contrast image. Move the flash away from the lens and you start increasing the contrast of the image because now you are seeing more of that shadowing. The same thing applies to a low contrast lighting source. By altering the composition, exposure, and post-processing, you can get a high contrast image from a low contrast light, and you can get a low contrast image from a high contrast light. The main thing to remember is that high contrast lights always produce hard shadows, and low contrast lights always produce softer shadows. In the next chapter, you will learn about the three things that can happen when light interacts with matter. When light hits an object, one of three things can happen. The light can be reflected, it can be transmitted, or it can be absorbed. In this lesson, you will learn about absorption and reflection. You probably know that a white object appears white and a black object appears black because a white object reflects almost all of the light and a black object absorbs almost all of the light. But what is actually happening to the light energy? As I researched this, I came across several explanations. A lot of what I found talks about what happens when a photon hits a single atom or molecule. But this is not really relevant to photography, because you're not going to be photographing the interaction between one photon and an atom. Another thing to consider is that materials made out of the same atoms can look vastly different. Take graphite and diamonds both of which are made up of nothing but carbon. Graphite is somewhat reflective and not transparent, and diamond is reflective and highly transparent. So, it makes more sense to talk about material on a larger scale. What I have found is that when light interacts with material, it's interacting with the collective structure of that material. Depending on this structure, you can have different interactions with light. So let's get back to why black objects look black and why white objects look white. Non-transparent objects will reflect and absorb the visible light that hits them. Even in the most reflective objects, there is some of the light that will be absorbed, and with objects that have a high absorption, some of the light reflects. A black object looks black because it's reflecting very little of the light that hits it. But what's happening to that light energy? Well, the simple answer is that it's transformed into heat. 
Consider for a moment that all matter is vibrating at the molecular level. This is why everything has a temperature. Even very, very cold things are vibrating. They're just vibrating more slowly. When light hits matter, some of that energy that is not reflected is at a particular frequency that causes the molecules of an object to vibrate. These molecules interact with neighboring molecules, and the result is thermal energy. All light at that particular frequency is gone, and it's transformed into heat. Something different happens with reflection. Some of the light that strikes an object will be at just the right frequency to cause the electrons on the object to move to a higher energy level. Once that energy from the light is absorbed by exciting those electrons to that higher energy level, the light energy is gone. The energy of the photon comes in and is momentarily absorbed and then re-emitted back out of the molecule. Absorption and reflection are how you see color. Like you learned earlier, white light isn't really white. White light is photons of all colors traveling together, and our eyes perceive this as white light. If white light falls onto an object that's orange, we are going to see orange light being reflected back to our eyes. This means that nearly all of the other color frequencies are being absorbed and transformed into thermal energy. I say nearly because it's likely that some of the other frequencies, besides orange, are probably being re-emitted, but at a much lower level. So low that they have very little or no effect on the color that we see. Another possibility with absorption and reflection is for the light energy to cause the molecules to vibrate and move an electron into a higher energy level. Because some of that light energy was transformed into vibrational motion and lost, the electron may emit a photon at a lower energy state than what originally came in. This is roughly how fluorescence works. In fluorescence, a higher energy, also known as a higher frequency light, hits an object, but the object doesn't re-emit that light at the same frequency. Instead, it re-emits a photon of a lesser energy in the visible spectrum. Most of the time, you have seen this with ultraviolet light. This is because ultraviolet light is higher energy than all the other frequencies in the visible spectrum, and it's invisible to us, so the effect is much more dramatic. It essentially makes things look like they are glowing in the dark. However, this can also happen with just about any light frequency higher than red. Because fluorescence is the emission of a lower energy photon, it makes sense that you can't get anything to fluoresce with red light because there isn't anything lower than red in the visible spectrum. Now that you have a basic understanding of absorption and reflection, it's time to talk about transmission, which is coming up next. In this lesson, you will learn about the basics of light transmission. In transparent objects, you know from your observations that light passes right through. When light passes through an object without being reflected, scattered, or absorbed, it's called transmission. How this actually happens is something that is incredibly complex to explain, and I don't think it's 100% necessary for you to understand exactly what's happening. Plus, consider that if light is transmitted perfectly without being reflected, scattered, or absorbed, it's invisible, so you can't take a photo of it anyway. Glass and other materials that transmit light often do not do it perfectly. There is almost always some reflection and absorption and refraction that go along with transmission. Refraction is the change in direction due to the change in the transmission medium. You have heard that the speed of light is constant and it never changes. This is true, but only in a vacuum. The speed of light in air is nearly the same as it is in a vacuum, but when light encounters a transparent material like glass or water, it gets slowed down significantly. When light is traveling through air and then it hits glass, it bends. How much it bends depends on something called the refractive index of the two media. The refractive index also varies with the wavelength of light. This is called dispersion and causes the splitting of white light into the colors of the rainbow in a prism. It also causes chromatic aberration in lenses. Water has a refractive index of around 1.3 and glass is around 1.4, but diamond is 2.4. Because of diamond's high refractive index and the shape of the ideal cut, it bends light more and causes the light to disperse, separating into individual colors. 
Unlike basic transmission, refraction can be photographed. What you have seen so far in this lesson has been direct transmission. This is where light passes through a material in a very predictable direction. Diffuse transmission is different. In diffuse transmission, the light gets scattered in unpredictable directions as it passes through materials like paper, etched glass, white acrylic, and thin white fabric. Often these materials are called translucent to separate them from transparent materials. Sometimes they are called diffusion material or simply diffusion. These types of materials are very important when it comes to modifying light sources. Some materials have a high level of absorption but still transmit light, such as color filters. Color filters are designed to take broadband light sources, like white light, and filter out certain frequencies. This is a subtractive process, which means that the light source you are filtering out has to be full spectrum. You can't take a green light and put it through a red filter. A red filter filters out green and blue frequencies, so green light will be blocked completely and you will get nothing on the other side. This is something to keep in mind when you are using various light sources. If you are trying to use a purple filter on a 2800K halogen lamp, you will get a lower output than you might expect. This is because a 2800K halogen lamp doesn't produce much purple color. So, when you filter out all the other colors, you are left with quite a bit less than what you might expect. If you wanted to filter out white light with a purple filter, you would be better off starting with a light that has more blue and purple to start. Almost any lighting source with a higher color temperature, such as LED, fluorescent, or strobe in the 5 to 6,000 Kelvin range, will have much more blue and purple in the spectrum. So when you go to filter out all the other colors of light, you'll have more purple at the end. On that subject, glass itself is a filter of light. Certain types of glass do a great job of filtering out UV light while letting visible light and infrared light pass right through. So that UV filter on the front of your camera? Yep, that's just a piece of glass. Now that you have learned the basics about absorption, reflection, and transmission, it's time to take a more in-depth look at reflection, which is coming up next. Most of photography is about managing reflections, and in this lesson, you will learn about diffuse reflections. There are three types of reflections. Diffuse reflection, direct reflection, and glare. And most surfaces exhibit a combination of these three. It's the mix of these types of reflection that gives a surface its unique look. According to the wiki, diffuse reflection is the reflection of a light from a surface such that an incident ray is reflected at many angles rather than just one angle, as in the case of specular reflection. Essentially, this means that the light will reflect off the surface in many directions. Let's look at an example. So I've set up my green laser here, I've put some smoke in the air, and I have my green laser reflecting off a very highly reflective object. This is actually a hard drive platter, which is a very highly polished piece of metal and gives a very good reflection. And you can see that the beam of light has a very predictable path. Now I'm going to switch things up to a white piece of paper, and you can see in this photo, the laser has a very definitive path as it comes in and hits the paper, but once it hits the paper, it's being reflected in essentially every direction away from the paper. There's no predictable path or discernible direction that the laser is being reflected in. It hits the paper and it's being reflected in all directions, including towards the camera, which is what's making that pretty cool lens flare there. So this is what diffuse reflections look like. White objects have a lot of diffuse reflection. This is why they look white from any angle you view them from. Check out this example. So in this series of shots, what I've done is I've set that plain white piece of cardstock on a black tablecloth, and I've shot it from several different angles without moving the light. So the camera position is changing, but the direction of the light relative to the paper is not changing. And what you'll see is that the white paper looks exactly the same in all of the photos. It doesn't really matter what angle or direction I shoot the paper at, more or less. I can shoot it from directly on top, or I can shoot it from a very low angle, and the paper looks white from essentially all angles. And this is again because this is a white piece of paper and white objects have a lot of diffuse reflection, which means the light is being reflected essentially always towards the camera no matter where I shoot it from. 
So diffuse objects are also not really affected by the size of the light or the contrast of the light. For example, this shot was created with a relatively large lighting source in relationship to these objects or a low contrast light. And then this next shot was created with a high contrast light or a smaller lighting source relative to these objects. And you can see, although the shadows change and the highlight on the objects changes, the white paper looks essentially the same in both photographs. Now, the exposure is just a hair different, but for all intents and purposes, the white paper still looks the same in both photographs. So diffuse reflections are not really affected by the size of the light, and to some degree, the direction of the light. They are, however, affected by the distance of the light. Just like you learned about in the brightness lesson, the inverse square law applies to diffuse reflections. This isn't so much the case when you're dealing with direct reflections, which is coming up next. In this lesson, you will learn about direct reflections and see how they work in lighting and photography. According to the wiki, direct reflection, also known as specular reflection, is the mirror-like reflection of a light from a surface, in which the light from a single incoming direction is reflected into a single outgoing direction. The word specular is sometimes used to describe the brightest part of a highlight. It's also used to describe highlights created from hard lights. Specular means having the properties of a mirror. So, sometimes these usages are correct, and other times they're just nonsense. To make things clear, I am going to use the term direct reflection instead of specular reflection. This direct reflection behavior is described by the law of reflection, which essentially states that the angle of incidence equals the angle of reflection. Let's check out an example. So in this demo, I have my green laser, a mirror, and a protractor that's printed out on a piece of paper. The light that's coming from the laser to the mirror is called the incident light, and the light that's leaving the mirror is called the reflected light. If you imagine a line being drawn perpendicular to the surface of the mirror, right around this 90 degree mark, this is called the normal line. The normal line divides the angle between the incident light and the reflected light into two equal angles. The angle between the incident light and the normal is known as the angle of incidence. The angle between the reflected light and the normal is known as the angle of reflection. And you can see, no matter where I put the laser, these two angles always equal each other. In this example, I'm shooting a hard drive platter here in a room with only one light source. And in the first two photos here, you can see that the hard drive platter looks black. That is until the camera is positioned right in line so I can see the reflection of the light source in the hard drive platter. Now the interesting thing here is that the light source that's being reflected in the hard drive platter appears almost as bright as the light source itself. I say almost as bright because mirrors aren't perfect and they don't reflect all of the light. There's always going to be a little bit of light that's lost to absorption. But essentially, the light source in the reflection is as bright as the light source itself. Now this would seem to break the inverse square law, because if I pulled this mirror back 30 more feet, the reflection of the light source would still be as bright as the light source itself, even though it's at a much greater distance. But you see, the thing that changes is the size of the reflection. Even though the light source appears to be as bright in the reflection, because the actual reflection is larger, it's reflecting more light. So if I move this light to half the distance, it's going to reflect four times as much light, exactly what the inverse square law says that it will. This leads us to an important concept when dealing with objects that have a lot of direct reflection. When you are trying to photograph an object that has a lot of direct reflection, you need to think more about positioning the lights and objects to reflect back to the camera. In other words, you don't think about how to light the object as much as you think about how to get the reflection of the light, which is pretty much the only thing that you're going to see, back to the camera. This leads us to the idea of the family of angles. I learned about the idea of the family of angles in a book called Light, Science, and Magic, An Introduction to Photographic Lighting. This is a fantastic book, which I highly recommend. The concept is fairly simple. If you are shooting an object with a lot of direct reflection, there is a range of angles that produce this direct reflection. Anything outside this family of angles is not something that your camera can see. 
This is an important concept to understand because it will help you determine where to position your lights. Because of the law of reflection, you can fairly easily determine where the family of angles is located with respect to the camera. If you are shooting a mirror-like object and you want to see a direct reflection of your light source in the mirror, you need to use a light source large enough to fill the family of angles. If you don't want to see direct reflection of the light in the mirror, you need to position the camera and the light so that the light is not located in the family of angles. So now that you've learned about diffuse and direct reflection, it's time to look at polarized reflections, which is coming up next. Way back in the beginning of this course, you learned that photons have an electromagnetic field that fluctuates as it moves through space. Now, you may have thought at the time, that's nice, but why is that really important? In this lesson, you will learn about polarized reflections and find out why. First, let's revisit that electromagnetic field one more time. The electromagnetic field has an electric field and a magnetic field that oscillate as the light moves through space. Conventionally, polarized light refers to the polarization of the electric field, so that's all I'm going to show you. This wave is polarized because the oscillations are happening in one direction. If you were to look at it from the front, you would see something like this. You have your x-axis here and your y-axis here, and the electric field is only oscillating in the y-axis. Most light sources produce light that is unpolarized, so if you imagine this x-y-axis, you have fields in this orientation, in this orientation, basically in all orientations. This is unpolarized light. So how does light get polarized? Well, as the name of this lesson suggests, when light reflects off of certain surfaces, the polarization of the field aligns itself to the surface. To your eye, it looks like direct reflection, only about half as bright. So if it looks like direct reflection, what makes it special? Polarized reflections can be blocked with a polarizing filter. A polarizing filter only lets light through if it's polarized in a certain direction. Check out this example. Imagine that this string is unpolarized light. You can see that it's oscillating in both the X and the Y orientation. Next, I'm going to place a few metal bars around the string to restrict the oscillations to the Y direction, or the vertical direction. This is going to simulate what happens when light gets polarized by reflecting off of a surface. This little metal wire that I'm placing over the string is going to represent a polarization filter. You can see if I align that polarizing filter in the direction of the polarized light, the polarized light is allowed to pass right through. As soon as I turn my wire 90 degrees relative to the polarized light, the polarized light is blocked completely. You can see there's no more oscillations happening in the string. The vibrations have stopped. And this is exactly how a polarization filter works. Like it's polarized by reflecting off objects or transmitting through objects, and you want to block that polarized light, so you put a polarizing filter on. And then when you turn that polarization filter 90 degrees relative to the polarized light, the polarized light is blocked. In the real world, this has a range of applications. Let's look at a few. So this is a shot of the main street in the town that I used to live in, and I wanna show you what difference a polarization filter can make. So first, let's focus our attention on the windows in the buildings here. Now check out what happens when I put a polarization filter on and I orient it so I'm canceling out the polarized reflections. Most of the reflections in the windows gets blocked and it's a pretty dramatic effect. Now you may also have noticed that the sky also changes, and that's because when the sun shoots down through the atmosphere, the atmosphere reflects the light, and some of that light is polarized. So when you block the polarized light, we can see more of that blue color of the atmosphere. Now in this particular case, the effect wasn't super dramatic, but it depends on a number of things, the angle of the sun, the degree of moisture that's in the atmosphere, your angle relative to the sun that you're shooting. Now here's a close-up of my favorite Chinese restaurant on that main street, and you can see there are a lot of reflections in the window, and you can see the brick facade, especially the light orange color, is reflecting some of the sky. Now check out what happens when I use a polarizing filter and I rotate it to cancel out some of these reflections. The result is pretty dramatic. Check out this second window in the Chinese restaurant. You know what's behind that window? A plant and some pictures, which one of the pictures in the plant 
you can't even see without a polarization filter on. Now this effect is not limited to the outside world. We could also take advantage of this in the studio. High gloss black plastic creates mostly polarized reflections. And you can use a polarization filter to kill those reflections. Now you can see this product shot here that I did of my USB battery pack has a lot of reflections on it. This shot was created with one light and a large piece of white paper. And you can see there's a huge reflection on the top coming back to the camera. Now check out what happens when I use a polarizer. It's a pretty dramatic difference. And it's not only on the top of this battery. The sides in the front edge have reflections that have been reduced as well. So you can also use a polarizer in the studio to cut down on unwanted reflections and glare. In general, metal objects don't produce polarized reflections, but a lot of other objects do. So learning how to manage polarized reflections can be a really useful tool to have in your kit. Make sure to check out the last lesson in this course where you're gonna hear some final tips and tricks and get some advice to help you master lighting and photography. By this point, you have learned about the electromagnetic spectrum, visible light, how light acts like a wave and like a particle, learned about brightness and how it's measured, the color of light and the contrast of light. You have also learned how light interacts with matter through absorption, transmission and reflection. And you have learned about the three types of reflection, diffuse, direct and polarized. My hope is that after watching this course, you will see the world differently and not just from a technical or academic perspective. Learning about how something works is fine. For some, like me, you might even think that it's fun. But as photographers, we can take this understanding of light and put it to work to create better images. When you look at a situation, my hope is that you can take your new understanding of the types of reflection, the contrast of light, or the inverse square law and start to think about solutions for getting the images that you want. Whether you are creating lighting setups from scratch, dealing with a tough lighting situation, or a combination of the two, these fundamentals about light will help. Understanding light can help you both solve problems and see opportunity. It helps you to see the world differently, both technically and creatively. And finally, the lessons you have learned in this course will help you to take some of the guesswork out of lighting. Experimentation is still very much a part of every photographer's process, but if you have a vision for an image, the ideas you have learned in this course should help you to get a lot closer to unlocking how to pull it off. Thanks again for watching this course. My name is David Bodie for Tuts Plus, and I'll see you around.